Now, the impact was terrible. We had cracks in our ceilings, we had the doors off, glass everywhere. It was a disaster. So, it's two years on now and my family finally are back home in this beautiful house. Uh, Michael, uh, you came to visit me or oh, probably a year and a half ago when uh, it was in a terrible state. It was an empty house. You could see the cracks for yourself. This very kitchen was empty. People often say to me, Michael, what were the holdups? And the holdups were, there's quite a few. The first holdup was something called the six months uh, master plan. That means that the cart council and the Port and Light Trust had to sit down and come up with uh, a set of guidelines to give to contractors so they knew exactly what to put back in this grade to list the building. This house was built in 1897. So if you look at the ceiling above, all the ceilings apart from the living room had something called laughing plaster that had to be replaced and that's a specialised job. Uh, the doors, front and back, they belong to Port Sunlight as regards to their design. Because it's listed, isn't it? Yeah, obviously absolutely. that meant that it was not not just the standard job of repairing everything. It had to be done to, to still fit the character of this village, Port Sunlight. Absolutely. The other hold-up is some men came into the house, went upstairs and found in the plaster some hair. And they thought, that's anthrax. And they were terrified. Allegedly, in other countries, it has been known that spawns of anthrax has been found in horsehair. So they wanted to be cautious, and that's what they did. Uh, we waited patiently, and the good news is no anthrax. Again, the roof, uh, because it lifted up during the blast, it came right down, uh, creating structural damage. So we had to have the walls pinned. That was another wait. And then, of course, I won't get political because I'm not a politician or an MP, but we kind of went to the government on a few occasions to ask them to give to the community to help us not only in regeneration but to help the victims. I felt it was right alongside the community that they should step in because when we look around the UK you know yourself there has been a lot of disasters and we witnessed that in the media and the government has stepped in. So the question for us as a community over the last two years is why have you not stepped in to help us? The victims cry out. There was uh, such a financial impact upon our community. People uh, had difficulty, difficulties financially. For example, my wife and I, although we were living in temporary accommodation in Spittal, we were still being billed for this house. We had to pay the mortgage, but the um, energy providers were still billing us, yes. and that caused a lot of stress. Oh yeah, and that was featured on a documentary, wasn't it? That um, and then that that. That didn't just happen to you, it happened to some of your neighbours as well, and they had to move out. So, um, and how, you know, how, many, how much did they try to charge for what was? What, uh, well, very what obviously happened, entry to properties. Yeah, it was over a period of 16 months, so every month we'd get a bill sent here, and my wife would pick up the bill, go home in the temporary accommodation, pick up the phone, and she would talk to them and explain the same story. We are victims of the new ferry explosion. We shouldn't be paying this because we don't live there. And they would say things like, it's been noted. And then the following month, the same procedure, another bill, until uh, Rip Up Britain stepped in and helped us. And we're very grateful for them. And it was, it was standing charges, was it? You know, just, just yeah, the... Yeah, absolutely. But they didn't have anything to take notes. You know, they kept sending your bill to take note that actually that this was near the epicentre of the blast and they were still yeah. sending out those bills. I mean, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And, and also for the, for the community. I think what people don't realise is... Two years ago when that explosion happened, the full impact of that explosion wasn't just central. Uh, on the peripheral of New Ferry and the surrounding areas, people felt the blast. The impact wasn't just uh, the victims. You have to think about the victims' families and the friends' uh, relatives. So a lot of people were affected, not just us, the victims, but people in the family. So the, the psychological damage and the emotional damage is vast. And I remember walking past with yourself uh, a year and a half ago, the blast site, and just seeing the, the blast site and what were complete works, which is the dance studio above, performing arts, 
had put on the railings and it was a, a reminder of that horrific moment. So two years on, where are we up to? Well, as you can look around, you can see that a lot of the houses have now been rebuilt. Uh, some of the traders have moved back into shops, but on the other side, yes, the footfall for the precinct is still very low, and I think we need to work on that. Uh, there has been talk, and I've been to planning committees about regeneration and what's to be put back. So that's in the pipeline. That's something we will be working on in the future. But for us as a family, it is good to be back, Michael. I still have flashbacks sometimes. Um, for example, the other day, I was just sitting around somewhere and I, I thought, what if an explosion happens again? So there is that memory and haunting uh, memory of the explosion. I think it was two weeks ago that we had, or was it last week, two weeks ago that we had Into the Light. One of the problems that we kind of had was how do you mark the two year anniversary of the explosion for a community? Because you don't want to, you don't want to focus on the explosion and the, the, the memories that we have as a community. So what we came up with is something called Into the Light. And really the, that's an analogy of moving forward, going from the darkness into the light. It was a huge event. And we invited schools uh, and, of course, the victims of the community to come forward and meet us on that night and walk down the precinct with lanterns, which is a representation of light and moving forward. So many people, I believe, according to one newspaper, that over a thousand people attended. We had a platform, a uh, stage. Roger Phillips from BBC Radio Merseyside attended and hosted uh, the event. We had some choirs and poems. One of the poems was written by my mum. My mum is a well-known poet in the area and a lot of her poetry is featured in the Liverpool Echo and uh, in a book. But um, I read this poem and it says a lot about the community. Um, You've got it on there now, haven't you? Yeah, so it's on my computer, forgive me. Uh, I am an actor, by the way, so sometimes I, I learn my lines. Uh, but today we're just going into this blind. So um, I'm going to read it from... The page. It's called The Forgotten Victims by Evelyn Power, my mum, and it kind of describes how we feel as victims and the outcome of that. So I'm going to read that to you if that's all right, Michael. Forgotten Victims by Evelyn Power. These victims lost everything they loved and their lives were torn apart by an unexpected explosion that ripped out a community's heart. The devastation and destruction was likened to a war zone. No one could comprehend the reason why, as people fled their shattered homes. The community was stunned and helpless as sheer chaos lay all around. Victims' homes were torn apart as shops were raised to the ground. As the days slowly turned into weeks, no help was being received to help families find other accommodation. And a reason this atrocity was weaved. Almost two years had passed by, which brought about that dreadful night. But we thank God no lives were lost, and we pay homage to the people's fight. The butterfly is now the emblem of New Ferry, which brings freedom to the fore. At last, a light at the end of the tunnel will help heal those wounds so raw. So that was written by my mum. Uh, the Forgotten Victims. Uh, we also had another poem read by Roger uh, Phillips. And that really describes how we felt all those years ago. But to conclude, yes, it's been uh, a difficult two years, uh, both for, for my family and also for my job situation. Um, I am an actor, as I've mentioned. And being an actor and also a victim has been very difficult because you, you have to put aside your acting um, because you are constantly coming backwards and forwards to this house to look after it. You have the contractors in. One of the things I haven't mentioned, which I will do, and, and you didn't know about this, Michael, when you came to visit me on a few occasions, is the old contractors had spent 16 months here on and off, and they were kind of doing bits and pieces. Now, they'd only uh, really uh, visited this premise, well, these premises on five occasions, they were very nice, 
but they admitted and put their hands up and said, look, we don't have the manpower to continue the work on your property until this year, 2019. Now, this was last year and we were very emotional. Uh, things hadn't been done. Uh, they admitted they hadn't got the manpower. So in November last year, my wife and I contacted our insurance company to explain the situation. But thank God we got new contractors in and from November right up to uh, two weeks ago, they had worked hard. We got someone in called Thomasons and Atherton's uh, and they were excellent. The, the quality of work is first class and we were very emotional because they did a great job on the house. So looking back, it's been a roller coaster of emotions. You yourself, when we walked around the area, we saw the devastation of the blast and the impact it had upon the Port Sunlight Village and upon the new ferry precinct. But we are coming together again as a community. We're going forward. We're going to continue to talk to the government to get money for the victims because we, we think that's right. They haven't had it at all. No, in two not years, at all. It hasn't changed every time. No. You said oh, there hasn't actually been anything. No. But where will council presumably have... Um, have had involvement in that way and have had to make up for it. Absolutely, so we're hoping that they will distribute uh, financially to the victims and the traders. Uh, so what's going to happen now? Well, I'm quite happy being in this house. Um, it is emotional for me to talk because I, I think back to the struggle we had as a family over two years and um, you know, you have to remember that when, when the blast happened, the next day was Mother's Day. And I remember having all the gifts for my mum in this kitchen. Uh, so we couldn't get back into the house until another 10 days after the explosion because of, of the structural damage. We came in with um, people, security and insurance people. And, you know, just seeing the gifts for my mum, which we should have given to her on Mother's Day, was very, it was like a ghost town around here and inside here. It's very eerie. Uh, and when you walked around last time, you had the old footage and I was very emotional. You could see yourself the damage on the property. People don't realize that. But it, it's, 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 um, it's great. And I'm, I'm pleased to be back. Uh, and I'm working through my emotions. I'm working through the kind of anxiety I have. And I just look forward to the community once again, moving forward to regeneration this time. There are still a few people displaced and traders have to go back. So we need to work on that.